talk to you today about our current temporary exhibition, 30 Americans, um, which has been on view since early February, and is a project that I've been working on along with the rest of Jocelyn's staff for about two years. So it's a really exciting exhibition for us, and it's really a long overdue project at Jocelyn, and I'll talk a little bit about that more toward the end of my talk. Um, but I really want to dig right in. Um, I'll kind of give you some overriding themes of the exhibition. I'll talk about several of the artists, uh, but there are 30 artists in the show, and we've only got roughly 20 minutes. I want to give you plenty of time to go into the galleries and actually see the stuff in person. Uh, and I will be in the galleries afterwards, so feel free to approach me with questions or, or whatever. So this show comes to us from the Rubel family collection in Miami. Uh, Don and Mira Rubel started collecting in the 1960s um, and really amassed this really incredible collection of post-war and contemporary art. It grew in a very organic way. Uh, they started having conversations with artists early in their collecting career and have continued that as a method for building their collection, which is where this exhibition came from. Um, so they started talking to many young artists of color who were coming out of their graduate programs in the early 2000s and learned that those artists were not just responding to one another and kind of engaging in a creative dialogue, but they were also looking to the work of a much older generation of artists who the Rebels had already started to collect in depth. Um, so artists like Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, Barclay Hendricks, Robert Colescott. So the Rebels saw this kind of fascinating intergenerational conversation happening. So they started talking to some of these young artists about what would it be to do an, artist, uh, an exhibition exclusively featuring artists who are black. And this is sort of a contentious and fraught topic um, for a number of reasons. In the same way that doing an exhibition of all artists who are women or all artists who are Native American, there's something sort of necessarily otherizing about it. Um, but if done in the right way with a lot of nuance and impact, it could be really successful. And what they learned from many of these young artists is that they were thrilled to not just show alongside their peers, um, but just sort of over the moon to have the opportunity to show alongside these artists who had been deeply impactful uh, in the work that they were making. Um, so they first staged the show in 2008 in their warehouse in Miami. It's a former DEA facility, so they have many thousands of square feet. Um, and then the show started traveling in some capacity in 2011, and this is something like the 13th or 14th venue. But what's really great about it is that they don't treat it like a packaged exhibition, so I wasn't handed a stack of images and told, here's the work in the show, this is how you install it, here are the narratives that you weave through the exhibition. Uh, they really gave me carte blanche, and so out of the 400 some odd objects just in this part of their collection, I selected roughly 55, excuse me, 65 objects. I deinstalled two permanent collection spaces and I really gave it kind of real estate and room to breathe um, here in the, in the museum. Um, so as you can tell from this image, this is not all of the artists in the show, but it is many of the 30. Uh, it is intergenerational. These artists work across media, so you'll see painting, sculpture, works on paper, photography, video. Um, and there are 20 men and 10 women in the exhibition. And I wanted to share this quote with you because I often get asked about the title 30 Americans, where did that come from? So the rebels had to say, Americans rather than African Americans or black Americans because nationality is a statement of fact while racial identity is a question that each artist answers in his or her own way or not at all. And I think that's a really important thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind because certainly some of these artists are coming at race directly or are allowing race to be a, the primary guiding principle in their work, uh, whereas others just sort of let it rest in the background and others choose not to, direct, uh, to address race at all. Um, so as I said, I won't speak about every artist, but I will kind of guide you th through some of the major themes of the exhibition. Uh, perhaps one of the most important concepts in the show is this concept of simply creating a space for black bodies in art. Uh, we know that black subjects were woefully underrepresented in the arts really until the second half of the 20th century, century and this is certainly a vestige of the history, history of portraiture in Europe. Uh, portraiture was considered something that was reserved for those with class and money and status. Uh, and then the, the upshot of that became that very few people actually had their likenesses created. And then in America, we adopted that tradition uh, when a kind of America developed its own art scene. So what we see in the second half of the 20th century is this really important kind of tidal wave um, with the black power movement uh, arising in the uh, early to mid 60s, galvanized by the 1965 assassination of Omaha born Malcolm X. Uh, and alongside that, we see the black arts movement, which fashioned itself as sort of a, an aesthetic and spiritual sister to black power. Uh, and their mission was really clear. Simply put, they wanted to make art, uh, they wanted to present art that um, addressed the needs and aspirations of black America. So this is a loosely affiliated group. They were poets and writers, uh, playwrights, photographers, visual artists, choreographers, sort of all aspect of the arts, um, and they came together to pursue this mission. Now, none of the artists in the show were really making work at that time. It was sort of before their time. However, artists like Barclay Hendricks have really carried the mantle of the black arts movement. 
Um, so Barclay studied in Europe as a, as a student um, in his, in his uh, undergraduate days, and he found that the work he was most drawn to were these great portraits that lined revered museum walls. But of course he noticed a glaring omission, which is that not a single person looking back at him from these walls looked like him. So when, we, when he went back to his native Philadelphia uh, after his studies, he really spent his career working to correct that injustice. So he would paint family and friends, acquaintances, people he simply met on the street. Um, and he uses a couple of important tools uh, for his portraiture. First, he gives his, his subjects a lot of faculty. Um, he allowed them to dress in the way that they wanted to when they came in for a portrait. Uh, he allowed them to kind of position their bodies in the way that it presented their personalities. So they have quite a lot of agency. Um, perhaps most importantly, and this kind of recurring device we see, is that he isolates his figures quite often against monochromatic drop backdrops. And this is a way of presenting black subjects without equivocation <laughs> or distraction. Simply put, he's saying black bodies belong in art, and here they are. Um, so this is a, a really wonderful painting from 1978 called Noir. Uh, when you see it in the galleries, I, I think you'll agree with me that it's drop-dead gorgeous and perhaps one of the best paintings in the show. Uh, and it, you can't really tell so much from this image, but his suit is con consists of pinstripes. Uh, and apparently after making this painting, he said that he would never again uh, make a pinstri <laughs> pinstripe suit uh, because it was such a pain. Um, so part of our work to be more inclusive, both at Joslin and for this exhibition, involved developing a community advisory council, and we have at least one member here today um, who helped us not just think through messaging for the show, but also think through programming. How do, we, how do we do this in a really nuanced way? And one component of that was that they helped us with um, the audio guide. Typically with the audio guide, I record all the stops, and you kind of hear me droning on by the end. Uh, but in this case, four women on our community advisory council self-selected to do audio guide stops for the show, and they each did two stops. So Barclay Hendricks Noir is one of them. Um, if you have the time when you're in the galleries, I highly recommend it. It's a really kind of wonderful layer of perspective over this exhibition. So if Barclay Hendricks was simply creating a space for black subjects, um, someone like Kehinde Wiley, whose work you may be more familiar with, um, he did President Barack Obama's official portrait that's currently hanging in the National Portrait Gallery in DC. Um, he really has spent his career working to elevate and celebrate uh, black subjects. Um, so, again, hard to tell from this image, but this is a massive painting. It's about 300 inches long. It, it occupies one entire wall in the galleries. Um, and scale is certainly something, one tool that he uses to elevate these subjects. Uh, but there are a couple of other recurring things um, that are worth pointing out. So this uh, elaborately articulated floral backdrop, this is something we see across Gehindi's work in almost all of his paintings, if not, if not everyone. And he uses this for a couple of purposes. First, they kind of suspend his sitters in time and space, so it almost looks as though this figure is floating in a way. Um, but they also do uh, kind of help him, help him counter the narrative that black masculinity is necessarily threatening. And this was a really poignant assertion for Kehinde Wiley. He grew up uh, in an urban setting. Um, his mother plucked him out of school every single day and put him into after-school art programs uh, to come, kind of help keep him off the street. And he spent a lot of time looking at uh, mugshots. He said he felt like his only model for portraits of black men were mugshots at the time. And he says, you know, in comparison to like, the portraits like Barclay Hendricks was looking at, those are f subjects that are self-possessed and they have this sort of stately grace and they are, they are in control of their own story. Whereas in mugshots, power is completely ripped away and someone else has taken the power to tell their stories. And that's a kind of thread we th see throughout this exhibition as well. So for this particular painting and several others from 2008, uh, he did a number of canvases with prone bodies. He was actually quoting a painting by Hans Holbein the Younger, a German artist in the 1520s, uh, and this portrait depicts Christ in the tomb. So he's drawing a direct comparison to his subject here and a, a Christ-like figure. So I found this great, great quote um, by Toni Morrison as I was preparing uh, for this talk, or not for this talk, for this exhibition. Um, we know that women have been subjected to silencing in the arts, this is well documented, but if women have been silenced, black women have been particularly silenced. Um, so Toni Morrison has said, the black woman has had nothing to fall back on, not maleness, not whiteness, not ladyhood, not anything. And out of the profound desolation of her reality, she may, may very well have invented herself. And so I think that the women in this exhibition really embrace and embody the spirit of self-definition. Um, so, when Gechi Mutu uh, is actually the only artist in the show who was not born in the States. She was, uh, she was born in Kenya and she came here for art school as a young adult. Um, and she has spent her career looking at um, how black and brown women navigate the global community and sort of the forces that across the world that impact what it is to be a, a woman. So when she came to the States, she said she was particularly struck by magazines, things like fashion and lifestyle magazines that you see when you go to the bookstore. Um, many of those tell women what to wear, what not to wear, what, eat, what to eat, what not to eat, sort of all these incredible forces that impact 
impact what, what femaleness is in the States, and she was sort of comparing that to her own experience in Kenya. Um, so she really embraces the every woman is a hero um, and makes these kind of anthropomorphic, part body, part human body, part animal, part plant-like figures. And in this case, this figure seems to really kind of exert itself and almost is, is bursting from energy at the top of the image. Um, when you get close to this, you'll see it's actually collaged. There's this really richly layered surface. Her primary source material became those magazines that she was so drawn to. And she relishes this process of destroying them as she cuts them apart looking for imagery uh, because she says it allows her to dismantle hierarchies regarding race, gender, class, ethnicity, sexuality. Um, so this particular work from 2007, she made it a time when she was having trouble traveling uh, due to visa issues. Uh, and so the title from French translates to No, I Regret Nothing. So despite the kind of struggles with self-identity that accompany migration quite often, um, she says that she would, she would never go back on that experience. And, and that experience of migrating has allowed her to resolve the invisibility of black women worldwide, in her own words. Um, so the phrase that has run kind of through my head consistently as I've, as, as I've, I've worked on this exhibition is what can be done um, and what are the, the various ways that these artists and others uh, address racial inequality and power imbalances. One way is to engage historical figures who have done exactly that. So Glenn Ligon is better known for his text-based work and you'll find two paintings uh, and then a neon installation work in the show that include text. Uh, but for this body of work, he had found civil rights era coloring books that um, depict notable black figures from throughout history. Uh, people like Isaac Hayes, Harriet Tubman, George Washington Carver, and then Omaha-born Malcolm X. Uh, instead of making straight paintings from these, he worked with classrooms of racially, racially diverse children, and he photocopied the images and distributed these to the kids, and kind of gave them, gave them free reign, said, you know, it's like any other coloring book, do what you will with it. And in this process, was fascinated to see that these kids addressed these images without any concern or awareness for who these figures were. They were relatively young, somewhere in the ages of like four to eight years old. Um, so maybe they may have heard of some of these people through education and family, um, but they, they gave no care to kind of the, the, the power of these images. So this got Glenn starting to think, well, maybe it's not the likeness of these incredible figures that matters, it's their legacy, it's what they stood for. Uh, it's their kind of their aura in a way. Um, and he said that each generation makes the Malcolm X it needs, or rather that we need to reimagine the heroes of the past to meet the demands of today, uh, because simply looking at an image of Malcolm X isn't going to address what we need to accomplish in 2019. Gary Simmons, so if we talk about heroes like Malcolm X, um, we need to talk about why heroes are needed. Um, so this is arguably the most difficult work in the show. Um, it is the most kind of explicit representation of violence against black bodies in this exhibition. Uh, Gary is known for recasting symbols associated with power um, into sort of unexpected uh, installations. Um, so I'll sort of unpack what you're seeing here because I know some of you are, are quite far away. So you have a stool, uh, circle of stools, um, kind of wooden stools like you might find in an elementary school art classroom perhaps. And then each stool has a handmade clan hood atop it and dangling in the middle of the circle is an empty noose. And he's titled this installation Duck Duck Noose. Um, of course, it is a jolting reminder of the terrorism that the KKK enacted uh, against communities of color, primarily from the 1880s through the 1960s. Um, however, there's, there's a lot going on here, and it's very timely. Um, we had a lot of conversations internally, externally, with our community advisory council about do we include this work? How do we frame this work? What kind of context do we put it in? Uh, and the, the resounding response was, if you don't include this work, it is a missed opportunity to have a really important conversation, one that has directly impacted Omaha for now a generation and probably will to come. Um, as many of you know, this is the 100-year anniversary of Will Brown, the Will Brown lynching. Um, and it's, it's timely for another reason, too. You know, this is a moment in our history where white nationalism has really thrust itself into the mainstream political conversation. So this is, this is not a story of violence against black bodies yesterday, this is timely today, and a conversation we need to continue having as a community. Um, so he titles it Duck Duck News, he's referencing Duck Duck Goose, of course, this childhood game that hinges on decision making. Um, so what he's suggesting is that racism is not innate. We don't, we don't come into this world embracing racist ideologies. We are taught to embrace racist ideologies through school, through peer groups, through family, um, through media, through the internet. Um, and beyond that, at a certain point, you can choose to embrace those ideologies or you can choose to walk away from them. So he's suggesting that there is choice involved in, in enacting racism. Um, secondly, there's also this sort of uh, arbitrary nature that accompanied many lynchings. Often it was the being in the wrong place at the wrong time when uh, a vigilante group decided to, as they said, enact justice. Um, so Duck Duck Goose, of course, is often kind of a chance, uh, a chance selection. Um, so 
this, like I said, one of the most challenging works in the show. It's in the, the kind of last gallery. Um, you know, if you if you need to kind of navigate around it, I, I welcome you to do that because it certainly is um, a kind of a jarring moment to encounter this walking into the space. Um, so central to the themes I've discussed so far is this kind of broader consideration of power dynamics and how power imbalances perpetuate racially motivated discrimination and oppression. Um, so this painting by Nina Chanel Abney, who was one of the, the younger artists the rebels were looking at in the early 2000s, um, is, was her final painting as a graduate student at Parsons. She was the only black student uh, in her graduate program, and this is sort of a common reality across uh, art schools in general, but particularly graduate programs. Um, there's a disproportionately low number of students of color. Um, so in talking with her fellow classmates and in staff and faculty leading up to her thesis project, uh, she learned that a lot of students and faculty had trouble engaging with her work. They said, we can't see ourselves in your work uh, because you are addressing race so, so directly. So she said, okay, well, I'm gonna make a class portrait for my final project. And they assumed, you know, if you can, we've all been in that situation, you walk into the, the gymnasium, there are risers set up, you file onto the risers and you walk away. She had talked about it in that way, but she pulled a little bait and switch. So when she unveiled this painting, uh, she showed her classmates that they had switched her races, their races, and then recast herself as the only person in a position of power as the white armed correctional officer on, on the far left of the painting. Um, so in thinking about this, this low number of students of art, in art schools, it led her to another all true reality um, for uh, communities of color in America, and that is the disproportionate number of um, black citizens incarcerated in the United States, which is deeply tied, of course, to the history of mass incarceration, the war on drugs, um, and the sort of long history going all the way back to, to slavery and Jim Crow era policies. Um, so she'd done a lot of research into that and decided that this was sort of the perfect frame uh, in which to have this conversation. Apparently, when she unveiled the painting, it got kind of mixed responses. Some people were furious. Uh, they had never been deeply implicated or implicated in a deeply in uncomfortable conversation about race before, and so they, they didn't like that. Uh, some people thought it was funny. They were sort of in on the joke. Um, so she gave some of these, these figures identifying factors, like maybe a pair of earrings that a girl wore every day or a hat that a guy donned on, on a regular basis so they were sure to see themselves in it. Uh, and some people apparently just, just didn't get the joke. Um, but she said that it was the most uh, successful painting she'd ever made because as you'll see when you go to the gallery, it's a really wonderfully crafted painting. You want to look at it, but it is also, um, it, it, it stirs something in you and it stirs really kind of uh, strong responses. Um, Mark Bradford, uh, so he's actually one of my favorite artists in the show and someone who, whose work I've been following for a really long time. Uh, this work represents two threads in the exhibition, uh, the harsh realities of, of urban existence uh, and then the use of found and discarded materials, which has a really kind of long history, uh, particularly in post-war art. Um, so Mark grew up in South Central Los Angeles like Hendy Wiley did, and his earliest collages incorporate uh, paper perm wrappers that he gathered from the floor of his mother's hair salon. Um, and he took them back to the studio and he incorporated them into these really kind of lushly worked, uh, beautiful abstractions that almost take on the quality of a city map. So when you get in front of this, you can kind of imagine streets converging, for example, in the, the bottom right corner here. Um, he pretty quickly saw the limitations of those materials, so he started playing the role of ethnic, uh, excuse me, uh, urban ethnographer and would get things like um, shredded billboard paper that had fallen to the ground, uh, advertisements uh, put up on construction sites, handbills that were handed out, and he brings these all back to the studio and creates these kind of richly layered paintings. Um, his work is often associated with major development in post-war painting, particularly abstract expressionism, because he paints to the edges of his, um, of his surfaces. So if you're familiar with our Jackson Pollock painting, there's certainly a visual rapport here. Um, he also relies on using grids underneath kind of the surfaces of his collages, so people often compare him to the minimalists of the 1960s and 70s. But he's always been deeply skeptical about uh, the, the canon of painting and the canon of art history in general, and doesn't necessarily want to be inserted into that conversation. Uh, and he said that in bringing together revered materials like oil paints and acrylics with found materials that he's always fe uh, felt like a whore in the church of modernism. Thus the title of this painting, Whore in the Church House. Uh, Carrie Mae Weems. So the, the last couple of artists I'm going to talk about, and I promise I'll get you over to the galleries here shortly, uh, is kind of about the role of stereotyping in racial dynamics and how stereotypes have long been used to assert power. Alongside that, I want to kind of think through some of the tools for addressing and combating power imbalances and stereotyping. Um, so you may recognize these photographs by Carrie Mae Weems. We have two from the same body of work in Jocelyn's collection that were on view recently. Uh, the whole series is called From Here I Saw What Happened and I Cried. 
Um, so Carrie was doing research in university and museum archives, uh, looking specifically for images of slaves from the 19th and 20th centuries. And she came across a Swiss photographer who was also sort of dabbling in, in uh, anthropology and sociology. And he uses, uses these images that he has taken of slaves to support his claim uh, that people of uh, African descent are necessarily inferior. Um, so she takes these images, she rephotographs them through um, colored filters. Uh, excuse me, she free rephotographs them and prints them through colored filters. Many of them are this sort of crimson you see here, but there are two that are also in a kind of navy. Uh, she puts them in a circular mat. The circular mat is a reference to the camera, the idea that the camera is sort of an ultimate tool of authority and ne is necessarily telling the truth. Um, and then she inscribes each, um, the, the glazing, the glass on top of each with a phrase that reflects on how we may have uh, viewed these subjects at a certain point in history. Um, so from top left you have, you became a scientific profile, an anthropological debate, a negroid type, and a photographic subject. So it was really important uh, for Carrie not just to depict these individuals, um, but to kind of wrest some power back. So she said about this body of work, we're looking at the ways in which Anglo-America, white America, saw itself in relation to the black subject. I wanted to intervene in that by giving a voice to a subject that historically has no voice. Kara Walker. Um, so Kara, this is a work that I was really excited to be able to bring here because it was, it's kind of a bear to install, but it's really an iconic uh, early-ish work for Kara Walker. Um, she's known for creating these rambling scenes of the antebellum South using silhouetted figures. So she's borrowing a portraiture format that became popular during the Victorian era, although she's kind of turning it on its head and using it for very different means. Um, so the tableau in these, in these kind of rambling scenes um, are really populated with almost unspeakable acts of violence against black bodies, particularly black female bodies. Um, so the title of this work is Camp Town Ladies. It comes from um, American singer and songwriter Stephen Foster's nonsensical minstrel song, Camp Town Races. You probably know about minstrel shows, but they were skits, dances, and musical performances that were really intended to mock and embarrass and belittle communities of color. Um, so Kara takes this idea, uh, and instead of just regurgitating these stereotypes, which is a criticism that was leveled against her earlier in her career, she's really using them to call absurdity the stereotypes and to kind of give a little bit of agency uh, back to the subjects who are depicted. So in this work, we see a kind of loose narrative unfolding from left to right, and I say loose because there really is no kind of strong narrative uh, strain. Um, but perhaps the most important tool she's using is not uh, narrative, uh, writing a narrative, but rather she uses ambiguity. Uh, and this is something that I've actually been reading a lot about in her work recently. Um, so she, she gives us clues as to what's going on in certain scenes. Um, she, she gives us markers. So why do we read this as a jockey read, riding the black, back of a black woman? Well, there are certain features about that woman that make us say, well, that, that must be a black woman. And that then makes us think about um, our implicit and explicit biases and why we would just assume um, the, 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 these people who are both black, this is black tar paper, why would we assume one is white and one is black? The other bit of genius in this particular uh, vignette, which is why I pulled it out to show you here, um, is the figure on the bottom left corner, this sort of rabbit-like figure, appears to be shooting uh, at the man and the woman riding here. Uh, and when the first, probably 15 times I looked at images of this work, that's what I assumed to be happening. But if you trace the, kind of the angle of the gun up through them, you see atop this um, signpost that a bird uh, has been shot above them. But we automatically assume that the black woman is being shot at. I mean, it's all these kind of little tools um, that, that make us think one story, and then she, she literally, in this case, literally explodes that part of the narrative. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, so he, she said this to say, she's had this to say about her work. Um, so in, in kind of reclaiming and subverting these stereotypes and, and immersing us in these kind of this parade of characters that's at, at, turn, at turns disturbing and abject and darkly humorous, um, she said, when stereotypes attempt to take control of their own bodies, they can only do what they are made of, and they are made of the pathological attitudes of the Old South. Therefore, the racist stereotypes occurring in my art can only partake of psychotic activities. Um, so that's pretty bleak. Um, so I'm not going to talk about McLean's work, uh, but I just sort of want to have this image up because it's a great painting. Well, I kind of give a little bit of a conclusion here. Um, so much of what I shared with you just now likely gives you the impression that the show is, as I said, uh, rather bleak. Uh, and certainly there are a lot of moments in this exhibition where you will catch your breath or you will want to cry or you want to curse or you want to walk away or you want to rage. Um, but there really is, I think, a, a layer of hope embedded in the concepts that course through this exhibition. You know, there's... There's this idea of celebrating America's hard-fought successes in the battle for equality, while also advocating for the fact that we need continued reflection and conversation and action to grow as a nation and build a more just society. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Jocelyn is, is hoping to 
be taking part in that conversation long term. Um, this is a long overdue, and it's really part of a much bigger initiative for us. This isn't kind of one-stop shopping, as they say. Uh, we want to get the museum's exhibitions, collections, and audiences really looking more like what America looks like. And this is an initiative that started well before 30 Americans came to Joslyn, um, really kind of under the, the current director and the curators that are here. This is something that we said was going to be centrally important to the work that we did. Um, and so to that end, we have made some uh, important acquisitions. Um, I invite you all to come on May 23rd in the evening. We are going to be doing a public event to unveil some new acquisitions. It should be a really wonderful celebration of the galleries looking unlike they really ever have before. Um, so that's Thursday, May 3rd in the evening. Uh, and stay tuned to Jocelyn's website for details. And we've also done some kind of other related projects with this exhibition that help us think through inclus inclusivity more clearly. Um, so for example, in addition to the Community Advisory Council and the work we did with them, um, our education department collaborated with Blackburn Alternative School students to do a podcast um, that you can find online, and it's a really, uh, a kind of really wonderful document of how these young people are responding to an exhibition, and it is, um, uh, you know, a project that has, we have learned, has speak, spoken quite uh, clearly to them. Bless you. Um, so there are lots, there's lots going on, and that's to say, continue to pay attention and to, and to participate and to join us in this conversation because uh, we feel like we'd kind of be the leading force of talking more about inclusivity in the city, um, and I think it says a lot that all of you showed up this morning to, to participate in that conversation. So thank you for being here, and um, I only kept you five minutes longer, so go into the galleries now. <laughs> thank you.